Hello. Oh, that's loud. Hello. So. Today was supposed to be a day without Iron Brew. But it got to a certain point today, and the question was whether it would be connected by intravenous strip or by large glass. In the end, the need to find an actual clean needle precluded the intravenous strip. That and trained medical professionals have trouble trying to find a vein on me. Let alone me trying to find a vein on me. So, I didn't feel like really doing much at the moment before I go and get my tea. But I wanted to be productive. So I decided I'd go through and answer the questions. And when I was answering questions, I thought, well, I might as well just do the same as I did the other day and do a questions answered part three. So here they are. Now, the joy about doing question answers sessions where I'm talking to you is I kind of give a shout out to people who do, do really cool questions. Um, starting off, there was an interesting question from Andrew Cox, Teddy Roosevelt embracing the world. For some reason, that made me remember the old Coca-Cola ad, I'd like to buy the world a Coke. Totally inappropriate, I know, but as far as I uh, know, Iron Brew never did anything similar. As far as I know, Iron Brew has never done anything similar, but they probably should do. Um, and there was a good question about whether or not it was inappropriate. It was a directly di diplomatic, you know, ad. And Pepsi just got a big trade deal, the USSR at the time. And interesting enough, that trade deal involved, I think, Pepsi becoming one of the world's largest disposers of former USSR warships. But we'll leave that to one side. Uh, the uh, worry, though, seems to have been whether it was inappropriate to mention a rival carbonated dr soft drink to Iron Brew on this channel. Well, I have. It's okay. We can survive some mentions of Coke. Not it's being seen, probably, but we can survive it's being it's some mentions of it. Um, Anonymous bringing up and pointing out that back then often people often died early. I presume this is in reference to Teddy Roosevelt having a second wife. Yes. Um, what is interesting is that he married two such sparkling very highly intelligent women and very successful women. I, mean, I said one died in char soon after childbirth, but both were renowned for their time. So he really must mean something of a catch, because those, as much as anyone ever has options, those women certainly had options. Several people commenting the US needs another Teddy Roosevelt. I would say if they would need an... It would be a Teddy Roosevelt of the current age. I have to say, I would love to see one I would, in either the Democrats or the Republicans. I'm not sure I do. Someone who can both combine reaching for the stars with pragmatism. I had hopes. Not really with the most recent president, but with some of the presidents, they had potential. They either seemed well-grounded in pragmatism, so you just hope they did a bit of reaching for the stars, or they definitely reached for the stars, but you weren't sure how grounded in pragmatism they were. Another round, maybe. Anyway, let's go up. The good thing about elections is they happen again. Uh, 
And those questions were all on part one of two. Then part two of two got um, a nice comment from Samuel Nomitz. Thank you. Then we had Sal Mercalano talk, uh, give me a question. Uh, you are correct about the cru uh, cruisers, but they did pick up the armor cruisers on the West Coast. They sailed part of the way across the Pacific. Then they then detached for a visit to Samoa. The thing I don't really include them is because, unlike destroyers, they don't even cl complete one leg with the group. They basically turn up and are there, and then it's a wasted scenario. It's a case of, you have cruisers, you don't have many cruisers, but you do have some cruisers. This is a perfect example where they could be used. And the Empire Cruise is a classic example of that. If we go through to part two, where I talk more about it, uh, the route in length and compare them. The Empire Cruise, you can see the cruisers go off on their own cruise, but they're still, broadly speaking, keeping the route with the big ships. And that's the thing. There are more ports you can get cruisers into than you can get battleships into. Admittedly, at this time, some of the cruisers were bigger than some of the battleships, but tends to be the cruisers were slightly shallower. Um, Roger H. Werner. Um, TR was a brilliant political leader, an extraordinary man, and his wife Edith remarked, as his wife would remark, a force of nature. The present U.S. Navy and modern U.S. international policies are a direct result of Roosevelt's visions. And that's to part one, Roosevelt's dream. And I have to say, I agree. I think, I think there is a lot of stuff which is overblown about Roosevelt, but I think there is also a lot of good lessons forgotten about Roosevelt, which both parties in the U.S. could do with remembering. There is some stuff he did which really wouldn't fit with the modern world, with the world we are in now. And we need to be honest about those stuff. But those things. The way he went about things, the respect he brought to them, the balance, and his overwhelming love for his country, and preparing to put the country before person. Those are ideals, which are good in a leader. Um, I'm Anonymous. I just don't see enough ideological split between the USA and UK at this point in history to be able to draw any useful parallels for how to cope with China. Uh, that's part two of two. Well, you see, you're presuming that the American force was aimed at Britain and the Great White Fleet was aimed at Britain. I don't think the Great White Fleet was aimed at Britain. Because what is the major power that's announcing itself in the world at this point? It's growing its navy, it's making all sorts of claims, and that wants a place in the sun. Germany. What's the other navy which is growing and has just fought a war? Japan. Japan is in the Pacific, which is America's backyard, and Germany's hunting for place in the sun. And South America might look ripe for it. Both are potential issues and potential problems for the America at this time. In fact, for Germany at that time, fighting a war where they managed to beat up the US Navy or beat up the US could have been a very attractive option for a way of establishing their position without necessarily needing to confront a matter of Britain. Because Britain may or may not have got involved. Probably would have, but might have let them do it both weaken each other a bit first. So this is the point. You cannot see the Great White Fleet as being targeted on just one power. Yes, Britain has to be factored into it. Yes, I'm going to talk about Britain in relation to it. But here is the clue about which, fleet, uh, which nations they don't visit. The 1923-1924 Empire Cruise doesn't visit Japan. It does visit America. The 1907 to 1909 Great White Fleet visits Japan, doesn't visit Germany. And apparently Ho Chi Minh was a historian. Was he a bad leader? Um, I'm fairly sure if, for some people, he certainly was a bad leader. But honestly, if you're from the perspective of the Americans who managed to lose to him, he was probably a fairly effective leader.
Anonymous, as you go on, we we have further, there's some further comments made, but you, one important point there is actually a response to the point I've just made. Thank you for your works and reply. I never thought of that. I just thought that with a, the Berlin Treaty around 1874 or so that definitely divided up Africa, colonization disputes over colonies ended. Germany had and has cultural colonies in Brazil to this day and even in Argentina, but those have no legal statements, just statement, a set, uh, just, just settlement. Well, interesting enough, Germany was establishing some de facto colonies by giving very cheap loans to some of the South African, South American, and some of the African countries, which some of the independent ones, the very few independent ones, and basically calling in those loans. And one of the potentials for those loans, if called in, was that German troops would arrive and turn you into a colony. And the British were suspicious the Germans trying to do that, which is why the British go along with the Germans to blockade a country which has defaulted on its loans. And mainly it's to keep the Germans honest. It's also to get the British money back, but it's to keep the Germans honest. And that is one of the reasons why, if we go back to it, this co the uh, Roosevelt colliery is established. Because of that particular threat, because of Germany carrying that out. Now, we can all say that no country would ever do the same today, but be careful. We have to be careful with such a scenario. There are many levels of colonization, there are many levels of control that can be established. We often describe the West after the end of World War II as part of the Americans' informal empire or circular sphere of influence. No actual direct control, but definitely sphere of influence. Um, anonymous, how did the Great White Fleet coal? I can't imagine them doing that without more than some British cooperation. Well, as Thomas Rottweiler has correctly applied, Wikipedia has this federal regulations that restrict the supply vessels for Navy ships to those flying the United States flag, um, complicated the, by a lack of adequate United States Merchant Marine, proved another obstacle. Roosevelt initially offered to award Navy supply contracts to American skippers whose bids exceeded those for foreign captains by less than 50%. Many carriers declined this offer because they could not obtain enough cargo to cover the cost of the return trip. Two months before the fleet sailed, Roosevelt ordered the Navy Department to contract 38 ships to supply the fleet with 125,000 tons of coal. It would need to steam from Hampton Roads, Virginia, to San Francisco. Only eight of these were American registered. Most of the other 30 were British registry. This development was potentially awkward since part of the mission was to impress Japan with the present reception of overwhelming American naval power. What it did impress them with was the fact that the British were prepared to support America. Remember, in 1905, the Anglo-Japanese treaty is not that old. And at this point, there is a very real possibility that there is a new tripartite alliance forming Britain, Japan, and America. That There are certainly various British ministers who would like the idea of such an alliance and the three of them dominating the world because Japan is another maritime power, an island nation, so they have a kinship, it's felt. And America is the largest, uh, shares the la land border with one of the largest colonies but is also mainly a land power with some sea power growth and is English speaking. So felt to be, again, a potential nation in arms. And I must have respond, Thomas Rotter, fortunately, I am at, lib at liberty to say Foreign governments, especially ordinary people, do not distinguish between countries populated by the same language group. Example, how much distinction do you draw between France and Belgium? Then ask yourself, how much, how much distinction would someone with no great education make? There are, in fact, communities of natural affinities, whether by language, religion, or ideology. Hmm. 
And the fact is, the British skippers and the American skip uh, uh, could, and the British crews could get along with the American sailors. And there might have been there is sort of some interesting ideas about other things which were done to make it it easier by the Admiralty for them to get such uh, so many coal ships. <laughs> Right, Thomas Wright again. Uh, this is on uh, part two of two. 100 plus years on, and the whole thing looks like American swagger, going equipped with enough force to remind other countries not to mess with USA. A Freudian slip might also suggest another a reading of the big stick. Possibly. But, as Bill Bolton has pointed out, showing the world your big stick is one thing, but this isn't Zeng Hey extracting tributes. This is a friendly greeting with a firm handshake, the handshake that lets it be known you've been going to the gym. I would argue, and my own response is yes and no, certainly some swagger involved, but again, that is presence. You need to be noticed for it to work. Fading into the background doesn't work then, and it is useful. Because showing you can show up, even with the help of British coal freighters, means that from that point on, people can't ignore you. And that's what this is all about. This is about basically America saying to the world, you can't ignore us. We're here. We can show up. If we have problems with you, we will come and deal with them. All right, then. Uh, let's see. We have Stafford Thompson. I've been looking forward to this all week. A good hard look at why you build a navy and what to do with it. I hope that my thoughts and views on the matter aren't that far off, although they are. Uh, if they are, it will be nice to learn how mistaken I may or may not be. So far, this has been another classic one. Keep up the great work, best wishes, and take care. As always, Dr. Good. Thank you, Stafford. And the whole point that I like to encourage with the students, and I hope with YouTube viewers, is that we can all have slightly, we can all have different views. In fact, it's good to have different views because often it's only by, and let me explain this in the words of sort of adjusting for Teddy Roosevelt, in the words of both robust but respectful debate that we can truly work out what is the correct course or what is the best course. There might not be an easy yes or no, correct or not correct answer, but there might well be a better course or a, le or a less capable course of action. Um, from Graham, 1973. Hello, Graham. Great, sir. But this, that discussion of showing the flag made me think back to the opening of a novel called Two Hours to Darkness, the first novel by author Anthony Drew. It was published in 1963. The author in an interview indicated it was inspired in part by US officers of both Polaris missiles and George Washington-class submarines to the UK in the early 1960s. In exchange for this, the US demanded the right to have an officer on iron ships who would have the right to prevent the British from launching the missiles if the US did not want them to. In the end, the UK got Polaris, but their own ballistic missile submarines to launch them and avoided having the US, uh, uh, um, US gain right of refusal over missiles under British control. The novel opens with HMS Retaliate, one of the six George Washington-class subs sold to the RN, along with the missiles docked in Stockholm to show the flag in the Baltic. I cannot say more as it spoiled the story, but the novel is well worth looking at. It. The idea, I have to say, the novel it does sound interesting, and it is also one of the ideas which has gone through. It was never really seriously considered by the British. The Americans were really keen on it. The British weren't. Uh, I, I can't think why. The idea of having a ballistic missile submarine doing a visit anywhere, even Stockholm, in terms of diplomacy, um, is something I can never imagine anyone really wanting to do. There's visiting America from Britain and Br America visiting Britain uh, with them, and there is visiting another country entirely. It's a uh, problematic. There are easier ways to make a statement. In fact, if you need to make a statement that big, it's probably more sensible to send a carrier battle group, or an LHD, or LPD, or anything large, capable with a load of things which can go la can deal with stuff ashore. You need to make that bigger political statement. Send something which is which 
doesn't lose its entire purpose if it is not in a secure if it is um, position is revealed and if it cannot get away to sea without security. Hmm. And we then have the question. The Bull Moose Party. Can we get a future arm res res resurrection of t with TR so he can run again? Now, here's the interesting thing about the Bull Moose Party. It was otherwise referred to as the Progressive Party. In fact, that was its more official name, but its symbol was a moose. So you had the elephant, the moose, and the donkey. Um, it was it's possibly one of the most successful third parties that have ever been formed in the United States. <laughs> And it was formed in 1912 by Theodore Roosevelt after he formed, he lost the presidential nomination of the Republican Party to his former protege, uh, protege and now conservative rival, plus the incumbent president, William Howard Taft. Basically, Roosevelt was a bit of a sore loser, but also he didn't think Taft was doing a good job. The new party was known for taking advanced positions on progressive and populist reforms and attracted leading national reformers. Wow. It was dissolved in 1920 and succeeded by the Californian Progressive Party and the Progressive Party which lasted till 1936. Basically, it died out after Roosevelt died. The party's platform built on the Roosevelt in Square Deal domestic program and called for several progressive reforms. Now, the Square Deal, if you've never heard of it, was a very simple idea and put in Roosevelt's own words. When I say that I'm for the square deal, I mean that not merely that I stand for fair play under the present rules of the game, but that I stand for having those rules changed so as to work for a more substantial equality of opportunity and of reward for equally good service. His three major goals were the conservation of natural resources, control of corporations, and consumer protection. If this, if this doesn't sound that different to what many populist groups are still running on today, and it actually, to be honest, it sounds kind of like a mo uh, so several modern platforms conservation of natural resources, control of corporations, and consumer protection. And by control, he didn't mean he wanted to nationalize those corporations. No, he, he just wanted to regulate them so that they couldn't form monopolies and they couldn't start acting like they were nation states. Pretty interesting, gentlemen. And, um, yeah. Progressive Party is a, an interesting group. They, uh, the platform, when he was running, called for the destroy the invisible government to destroy, dissolve the unholy alliance between corrupt business and corrupt politics is the first task of the statesmanship of the day. Strict limits and disclosure requirements on political campaign contributions, registration of lobbyists, recording and publication of congressional committee proceedings. In the social sphere, the platform called for a national health service to include all existing government medical agencies, social insurance to provide for the elderly, the unemployed and the disabled, limiting the ability of judges to order injunctions to limit labor strikes, a minimum wage law for women, an eight-hour workday, a Federal Securities Commission, farm relief, workers' compensation for work-related injuries, and inheritance tax. Oh my god, this 
man is sounding positively socialist. The political reforms proposed include women's suffrage, direct election of senators, primary elections for state and federal nominations, easier amending of the United States Constitution. The platform also urged states to adopt measures for direct democracy, including the recall election. Citizens may remove an elected official before the end of his term or her term, theoretically. The referendum. Citizens may decide on a law on a law by popular vote. The initiative, citizens may propose a law by petition and enact it by popular vote. And judicial recall, when a court declares a law unconstitutional, the citizens may override that ruling by popular vote. Alongside this, they wanted reductions in tariffs, limitations on naval armaments by international agreement, and they called for the creation of a national health service, arguably making Roosevelt the first major politician to call for health care reform. Seriously, those people who've commented that what America needs is a new uh, Theodore Roosevelt to lead them for the modern age are probably not far off because that sounds pretty good. And you have to wonder if that was the quality of political leadership for the time, okay? I'm, I am not saying that that is brilliant by today's standards or doing, but they we're talking about for 1912, calling for those things prior to World War I. That is pretty darn progressive and lives up to the party's name and the bull moose idea. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the questions. I hope you enjoyed part three of The Long Patrol, and I hope you'll tune in next Thursday for the live, when we will be discussing more about Roosevelt and what he wanted to get out of the Great White Fleet and what the Great White Fleet actually achieved. Because they were pretty darn cool. And they did a lot. We could also discuss about why he was so disappointed in Taft and felt that Taft really did... Um, let the side down in his perspective. But that could get me into trouble because there are some... I, I know there's at least one famous Twitter, tweeter, well, semi well, famous tweeter in terms of military, twi military Twitter, um, who is very, very in love with President Taft, so that could get me a lot of aggro. I'll enjoy it. But this is one of those events which had a lot of impact, the Great White Fleet. Uh, it's one of those areas of history where it's really worth thinking about. And tomorrow is Washington's Cherry Trees, the G3 and N3 class. And hopefully I can find the transactions which mentions them. It's in one of the boxes. It's finding out which box it's in. <laughs> Take care. Hope you're having a nice evening or a nice morning or whatever. And um, if you like the videos, please do subscribe. Please post like. Maybe a little bell down there. Come join us on Discord or if you're feeling very generous, patron, where you get to suggest and then vote for the, to the patron topics every month for one's next month. Which reminds me, I do have to post the uh, suggestion post for that. Take care. And see you tomorrow.